Now, grace must be seen. Grace has to be seen, or it is not grace. Grace has to be seen. Genesis 39, 2, turn over there. Genesis 39, 2. Grace has to be seen, or it's not grace. If you can't see it, it's not grace. Genesis chapter 39, verse 2. Joseph <clears throat> had dreams and shared them wrong. Brothers whipped him up, beat him up, and tore his coat off, and he was whipped, beaten, bloody, and they were going to kill him, but they saw a band of Ishmaelites coming. They sold him to a band of Ishmaelites. They took him down to Egypt and sold him to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh. And so he's in Egyptian bondage. He's whipped. He's beat. He's bloody. He's cut off from his inheritance. Don't have his uh, designer coat on. Don't have his cut off from his family's wealth, family's inheritance. But Genesis 39, 2 says, and the Lord. Yes. And the Lord. Hallelujah. And the Lord was with Joseph. And he was a what kind of man? Prosperous. He was a prosperous man. I like Joseph because of uh, uh, the time that this statement was made about him, he didn't have anything. So his prosperity was not based upon what he had, but it was based upon who he had. Yeah. Are you listening? I said his prosperity was not based upon what he had, but who he had. You see, the Lord was with him. He didn't have any money, didn't have any coat, didn't have any jacket. But the Lord was with him, and he was a prosperous man. Amen. Hallelujah. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Next verse, next verse, next verse. And his master, Saul. Everybody say Saul. You see, grace has to be seen. I say grace has to be seen. His master saw that the Lord was with him. Let me pause right there and ask you a question. Can people see that the Lord is with you? Is there any evidence? Is there anything showing to let people know? Can the world know that God is with you? Should be enough evidence. I've been out of town just driving, stopping in at gas stations. And, and, and know that, you know, the people in this area don't know who I am. And uh, I just go in places and people just say, my, my, my. They'll say things like this more than once, more than one occasion. Brother, you got an anointing on you. Well, I, you know, I, I didn't say anything about it. I'm trying to get a little Gatorade, a little gas, use the bathroom, get out of here. <laughs> say amen. amen. I've been in the Walmart. Now, here's real proof. You got an 89, 90-year-old woman rolling through Walmart. Here's real proof of it. <laughs> Just a rolling through Walmart. You know, and I stopped seeing this 89, 90-year-old lady looking at me. You, 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 now, you know, an 89, 90-year-old woman's looking at your spiritual look. <laughs> <laughs> Say amen. <clears throat> she ain't interested in nothing else. And so she say something like this. She say, praise the Lord. She said, I see God no all on you. Well, you know you got it with 89, 90-year-old woman. <laughs> Amen. I've had them come all, all the time uh, in Walmarts and shopping centers. Whoo, that nun's all on you. And you suck, 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 suck. And I try to calm her down. I say, whoa, 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 whoa. I say, whoa, calm down. She say, whoa, oh, that anointing on you. Suck, 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 suck. I say, whoa, 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 just calm down, calm down. She said, God showed me you one of his prophets, baby. And God's going to get you a bill. And, whoa. And I'd come and I said, all right, all right. I said, all right, thank you, thank you. Thank you for the building. Thank you, thank you. Just calm down. Please, calm down. Hallelujah. When you get a 90-year-old, they can see it. You got something. Hallelujah. Now, I've been 25-year-old. I've been in doubt. <laughs> Say amen. But when, when, when you see, see a 90-year-old woman, you know, it's, it's all gone. <laughs> Say amen. Amen. Hallelujah. The proof of the pudding's in the eating. If you got anything, somebody else ought to see it every, at least once in a while. I said at least once in a while they ought to see something. It's a reflection. It's a reflection. It's a reflection. So people ought to see something on you if you got something. And they saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. Next verse. Next verse. And Joseph found what was that they were seeing? And Joseph found grace in his sight. And he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had he put in his hand. 
they saw the grace on him. Joseph had something, Joseph had some evidence on him. He had a divine influence. He had two dreams in his heart that was resonating out of his heart. It was an outward shining of an inward grace. Say amen if you can. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Now, go to 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 25. 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 25. <clears throat> Talking about Solomon here. 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 25. 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 25. Talking about Solomon. He had the grace of God on him. And it was evident. People could see it. 1 Chronicles. Hallelujah. <clears throat> chapter 29. And I believe verse 25. I'll get that up and put it on the screen for me. 1 Chronicles chapter 29. When you get it, say amen. Amen. And verse 25, it says, And the Lord magnified Solomon exceedingly in the sight, in the sight of all Israel, and bestowed, everybody say bestowed. You see, grace is an act of granted favor that's bestowed upon the heart. And bestowed upon him such royalty, majesty, as had not been seen on any king before him in Israel. Now the Bible calls that glory, a magnification of glory. Solomon in all of his glory, the grace of God was on him. You have to see it, folks. You have to see it. Now I got one other reference I want to give you. Acts the 11 chapter. One other reference here, Acts the 11 chapter. Then I want to say a few other things about it. You learning anything about it? Yes. Hallelujah. Acts the 11 chapter. This is the account of Barnabas, you see. And uh, Barnabas had, um, there, there was a revival going on outside of uh, Jerusalem uh, among the uh, Gentile church. Now, you have to be careful when you read the Bible because you make, some people have made assumptions that uh, were not true. Acts the 11 chapter, these churches in Galatia, uh, Paul did not start these churches in Galatia. Some people give him credit for it, but, but he didn't just start these churches. Uh, many of these churches, particularly in Antioch and this province around about, were already started. And Barnabas went to fetch Saul and bring him because he knew he had something. Because he knew he had something. I got that, Lord. I'll, I'll, I'll make a comment on that. <clears throat> now, Acts 11, chapter, <clears throat> verse 23 well, that's verse 19. Make it real good. Get to just of what we're saying. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose brought <clears throat> about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but the Jews only. Preaching the word to none but the Jews only. So they were still locked up with the Jews. But some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene. Now, I'm a great one of recognition of, of blacks in the Bible. Blacks in the Bible. Everybody say blacks in the Bible. Blacks. Most of my ministry has been cross-culture. And I, I, I preach in prisons and so on and so forth where uh, Islam is the presiding religion growing in, in prisons and Christianity. There's a, the big fight there between the two. But, but a lot of people... Uh, have thought, well, I, see, I, when I came along and preached the way I do, I was rejected by the black race because I wasn't black enough. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't have a moan. <laughs> yeah, I could have did that. I could have got a lot of churches. I had a little of that inside of me, but I didn't choose to do that. And I didn't have enough rhythm for them, enough moan. They say, well, now you sort of sound like a white man, you know. They say, you sort of sound like Jimmy Swaggart or that old Roberts kind of a fella. And they didn't want me and I didn't want them. And then there's some people who say, well, now, you know, Christianity is a white man's religion. That's what they would say. Christianity is a white man's religion. I was challenged by the Muslims and different people. And I said, no, no, no. Christianity is God's. It's God's religion. It don't have anything to do with religion. It don't have anything to do with racism. It has everything to do with love and God for all races. Amen. But they would say things like that. And to say that, they would sort of imply that uh, everything that happened in the Bible was by white characters, and that wouldn't be so. That's right. That wouldn't be totally the truth. 
Amen. That's all races in the Bible. You can spot them and find them out everywhere. But there's some dear black men that was very instrumental in the move of God to the Gentile church, whereas Peter and the Jews would not go to the Gentile church. And so uh, these black men from northern Africa broke away, and they took the gospel to the Gentile church. Praise God for that. Now, if you study church history in the early century, that uh, evangelism was spared on by uh, Bishop Mason, head of the Church of God in Christ movement. Amen. People like... Uh, F.F. F. Bondsworth and John Lake couldn't get credentials among the white churches because they preached cross culture to black people. And so they couldn't get sanctioning and, and they couldn't get endorsement from the white churches. And so Charles Mason laid hands on F.F. F. Bondsworth and John Lake to send them away and send them to Africa. That's sort of what happened here, sort of the same thing. History kind of repeats itself. And so you look around in here, uh, these men broke away from Jewish custom, and they decided that the gospel was to the Gentiles as much as it was to the Jews. Say amen if you can. <clears throat> and so when they were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which, were, which when they were come to Antioch, spake to the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Thank God of that. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was at Jerusalem. And they sent for Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. We got a revival going on, and so we need somebody down here to help. Everybody say help. And so they sent Barnabas to come down and spy out what was going on. Who when he came, Barnabas, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad who when he came had seen the grace. You see, grace has to be seen. Now, what do they call grace here? They call grace here people getting born again into the kingdom, people getting filled with the Holy Ghost, people getting healed. Uh, when cross cultures begin to intermingle and mix, they call that grace. I said they call that grace. Are you listening to me? I preached a funeral for a prominent, uh, uh, a white guy, had, a member of a prominent wealthy family, he got born again in one of my meetings. He was what they would call the black sheep of the family. He went the way of drugs and uh, kind of embarrassed the family. So he was kind of family reject. But he came, the wife brought him to my meetings. He got delivered from drugs and got born again. And uh, uh, they had asked me to speak at his funeral. He had some kind of drug relapse or something. And uh, he was on his way up in life and, and he died young. And the family had sent for me and asked me, to speak at his funeral. Now, I didn't know I was going to speak. They said I was doing something called a eulogy. I didn't know what that was. Somebody called me that morning and, and said, are you going to the funeral? I said, yeah. They said, well, your name's in the paper to do the eulogy. I said, the hoology? <laughs> and so I suited up anyway and went. And uh, <clears throat> so I preached the funeral and uh, uh, quiet funeral, quiet funeral, quiet funeral. Praise God, quiet funeral. I just walked out from around the casket and started walking in the funeral and just scared them all, just start preaching <laughs> in the funeral. And I think I got two amens. I said, say amen in here. And one or two of them said, mine, <laughs> mine. Well, anyway, I, I was riding in the car with the, uh, with the, the pastor, the prominent pastor, and he said to me, he said, uh, you seem to be pretty successful with cross-cultural ministry and, and interracial ministry. It seems to work for you. He said, uh, I really want my church to integrate. I, I, I just, how do you get blacks in church? It, he said, I tried it once. I had a black family in church, caused me a lot of problems and so on and so forth. He said, the elite members, my top givers of the church didn't like it and I had a lot of problems with it. So eventually I had to ask this black family to leave because my tithes and offerings and stuff was going down. And so I, I, he said, how do you integrate? I said, well, I said, if you got to think about how or try to uh, think about how to integrate, I said, I don't know how to integrate. I said, but I can tell you what John Osteen told me. I said, I walked with John Osteen, walked through his church in uh, 1995, talked to John Osteen, and he said this to me. He said, uh, you know, he said, I, I, I have a third black. He said, you know, he said, I, I have a third white. He said, you know, I, I have a third Hispanic. He said, now go ahead and ask me how I do it. Go ahead and ask me how I do it. Ask me how I do it. He said, I preach the word and I love the people. I preach the word of God and I love the people. He said, you know, uh, I, I've never had a church split. 
He said, you preach the word and you love the people. And I said, you know, John Osteen running 10,000. And I said, he told me you just preach the word and love the people. And I said, but it could be. I said, if your church is not already integrated or interracial, it's not ready to be because you're not preaching the word. If you don't have enough word coming out from behind the pulpit to change the mentality and the attitudes of the people, what have you been preaching? You don't have to try to do anything. God will do it. You get enough grace that God will do it. You get enough grace there. God. You see the Jews and Gentiles alike. See, the power of God had waned in Jerusalem because they were shut up in the box with the Jews only. The miracles left Jerusalem and they went down there to Antioch. That's where the power of God was moving because they had people of different races, colors, backgrounds, and cultures. Say amen if you can. And when Barnabas came and seen this, he called it the grace of God and was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they should cleave unto the Lord. Say it out loud, grace, grace. Has, to be seen. has to be seen. There has to be a recognition of grace. Has to be seen. Now I want to say something else right, while I'm right here because I only got one more service to cover some things tonight differently. But I want to say this, uh, <clears throat> recognition of other ministry gifts is grace. If you don't recognize what God is doing in somebody else, then you, you probably got pride hanging around. You, if, if you're insecure with who you are, you can't see who I am. Amen. And it, an insecure person, a confident person, is the enemy of an insecure person. When you come around with a confident person, I, I, I want to say this publicly, pastors are some of the most insecure people in the world. Amen. They're afraid that everybody's out to get their empire, their sheep, their money, their ministry. It's hard to fellowship ar around insecure, you know, insecure pastors or ministers. It's always a competition thing. They're always eyeballing you the wrong way, thinking you're out to get them. You're doing something they're not, comparing themselves among themselves. <clears throat> I'm going to quote this story, and then I'm going to move on. In the eighth chapter of the book of Acts, you know, Philip was an evangelist. He went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. The people with one accord gave heed to the thing which Philip spat. You can put that up on the board, Acts 8, 5 through 8. Hearing and seeing the miracles which he did for unclean spirits, crying. What a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, many that were lame, taken with the palms, were healed, great joy in the city. 14 verse says, Now when the apostles which abode at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they came down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as of yet he's fallen upon none of them, but only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the point in this is that Philip recognized his grace. He recognized, I have a grace to get them saved. I can preach, I can get them healed, I can cast out devils. That's as far as my grace goes. And he baptized some of them. He didn't try to start a church, run a Bible school, and have a teaching center. Amen. He sent to Jerusalem, said, hey, boys. He dialed up there to Jerusalem, 466-76-3652. And he, he said, hey, boys, I got a revival down here. I got them all saved, got them all healed, but I need some help. Everybody say help. And so he said, I'm about to move on. He said, I'm stirred up. I'll wait, I'll wait on you until you get here, but hurry up and come on. And when Peter and John, who when they came down, they had something Philip didn't have. You see, Philip recognized that where my grace ends, somebody else's began. You have, to, you have to have the ability to recognize graces in other people. Now, I have this problem. A lot of people say, now, Brother Strawner, uh, 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 you know, uh, I know I need to get you to come to my church. I say, oh, you do? That's dangerous if you know you need to, because I don't know I need to be there. They'll say stuff like this. Well, now, I know I should support you. See, that's dangerous. What you're telling me is that God has spoken to you about doing something that you're in disobedience of. And they'll say things like this. Now, now, now Brother Strauder, now, this, doesn't, this doesn't ruffle my feathers. This doesn't exalt me. This doesn't give me the big head. But I'll hear stuff like this. Uh, if I heard it once, I heard it a thousand times. If I heard it once, I hear it everywhere you go. You're the best Bible teacher I ever heard teach the Word in my life. Hear it all the time. Doesn't do anything up here. Doesn't bother me. My first thought is, my, 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 you hadn't heard anybody yet, didn't have you. 
you, where you been? If I'm the best you've heard, you just hadn't heard much. And so, but they'll say things like this. I had one pastor, prominent pastor. He said something to me like this. He's around about 800. Well, over, really over a couple thousand now. And he said to me, he said, you know, I don't know anything about faith and healing, but it seems like you do. Now, he was building a $6 million sanctuary, and my thought was, well, you might not know anything about faith and healing, but you sure enough going to need to know something about prosperity because you got to pay for that building. <laughs> but he said to me, seems like you do. Seems like you do. Seems like you do. And I do. Well, it seems like to me, if he's smart, you don't have to know. Now, you should yes. know something about faith and healing if you're in the ministry yes. or hang your head and go home. Amen. But if you don't, you should find somebody who do for the love of God for your people and invite them in and let that grace be dispersed among your congregation. If you don't got that, you got pride in you. You're blocking your people from something God wants them to have. If you don't got that, you got pride working in you. I've had that happen to me again and again and again and again and again and again and again. I'll go to a church, get people healed, get, them, get the whole staff baptized in the Holy Ghost. The people are shouting, having a good time. I thought we had a good meeting and never get invited back. Never get invited back. Never get invited back. Used to periodically visit churches like that. I come in the back door. I quit coming in the back door. The ushers will get the best of you. You come in the back door, the ushers will grab, oh, you, you, you grab you, push out. Oh, my God, my God. Brother Strong, are you preaching today? My God, I hope you, I just hope he put you up. I hope you, are you going to preach? Where you been? Are you going to preach today? I said, no, 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 I'm just, I'm just here to visit. And they'll say things to me like this. They said, uh, uh, when are you going to speak again at our church? I said, that ain't none of yours or mine's it's business. That's between your pastor and the chief pastor, the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't set my schedule. I don't ask for preaching engagements. I don't ask to go, but I don't say no, unless he tells me to. I don't ask for any money, but I take what's all given to me. Are you listening to me? It's your job to find out who needs to be at your church. Amen. It's your job to pray. Yes. It's your job to oversee this. Yes. It's your job to bring the ministry gifts, to, to put them before your congregation. To, the, the pastor can't do it all by himself. Right. And if you won't do it or don't do it, insecurity is hanging around. And what you're fighting so vehemently to keep, you're going to ultimately lose through compromise. Yes. Amen. Say amen. amen. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, you see, Jesus is coming. It's time out for all this. We got to address some of these things publicly because it's hush-hush among us. And you know it so, and I know it so, and the whole church suffering because of it. It's a monopoly. People are preaching and swapping checks on friendship. Oh, yeah, you come to my church, and I'll give you a good offering, and then I'll come to your church, and you give me a good offering. Well, you better leave your friends out of the ministry. Oh, go golf with them if you want to, but you better call an apostle, a prophet, or a real teacher, a real evangelist to bless your people, whether your friends with him or not. Amen. Say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 